But also, if you can go through and think of about 10 things about each of these facts in that era. So, you know, if it's going to be something like, you know, the causes of the Great Depression and the New Deal, you, know, you come up with things like debt deflation, stock market crash, um, First New Deal, SEC, Glass-Steagall, WPA. You come up with about 10 things. If you could do that, you're bridging. You can't do that if you know where to go back and look and study. And you can double up. These are all in the same era, so you might use three or four for all of them in that era. But it's a great study aid. And it's all kind of the key. And this is something that years ago, talking to students who in the class and what's good ways to study, things like that. This was kind of their idea, then I took it and made it divided up in the periods. So it's just a, a great way, just an easy way to kind of go through. Oh, I don't know that era. I got to go back. All right. So one more thing. At lunch today, and I'll do this today and tomorrow, I will go through everything on that last, I'll go through everything on that last page. That last page, section nine is due. If you have any questions on that, I'll go over it at lunch. So we'll come in here, do lunch, ask questions. I'll go over anything on that. So I eat my lunch. Sound good? Okay, so let's go ahead then and um, the last little bit on Vietnam, and then I'm going to go through a bunch of these things. We have done brinksmanship. We haven't done Hungary or Sputnik. We have to get this last little bit on Vietnam. Now, we, we got this, didn't we? On Friday? Duem, the dictator, Dien Ben Phu. We got this. And we got the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong. Did we get this on Friday? Okay, so that's going to be the Civil War. That is the Vietnam War. That is it. Now, the U.S. will send its first troops to train South Vietnamese forces in 1959. Those would be the first American deaths. would be in 1959. The last ones in 1975. And so, North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh was leader, but more and more he is, he is becoming, he is pretty old by then, so it's other people taking in charge. And here's South Vietnam that the U.S. is trying to hold. So Eisenhower's made it important, then Kennedy will got it, Kennedy will make it even more important, then LBJ will make the big decision. So that means we're jumping to, let's go to 56, hungry. So you notice that's also in the packet, so you can either quick write in your packet or do it in your notes, either one. And hungry in 56, they removed a Stalinist dictator. The U.S. encouraged them to do it. And that's the head of Stalin. There's pictures of Stalin all over. Dictators always do this. Hungary right here. Now, you'll notice it does not border any NATO country. But the U.S. encouraged it, implying that they would help. A socialist government was created. They're kind of a moderate socialist government. Well, once the Soviets realized they were, the West wasn't going to do anything, and they couldn't allow the other countries behind the Iron Curtain to go, here's actually a picture of these are Polish tanks, but Warsaw Pact forces, but it was Soviet forces invade and brutally put this down. And there were cries from the last Hungarian radio station for the Soviets overran, saying, we're still waiting for Americans. We're waiting. And Americans did not come. And they're still pretty bitter about this in Hungary. But this shows the problem with brinksmanship and total war and the Cold War. Are you really willing to risk World War III? People in the United States, you, you, Americans. Be sure it might be great if they're not behind the Iron Curtain, but are you really willing to risk nuclear annihilation? Similar thing happened in 1938. Were you really willing to risk war? People of Britain or France. Oh, was fine. And right now, there are a lot of people still to this day think the U.S. should escalate and do more in Ukraine and start bombing the soldiers for so no flies. That could be World War III. With a very unstable leader of the Soviet Union with 5,000 nuclear weapons pointed at the United States. Are you willing to risk this? That's the point. The stakes are incredibly high. It sounded tough in American politics to say we're supporting Hungary. Are you really willing to do this? Well, ironically, this sounds like a very Stalinist move in a way it was, but I know I'm backtracking, but Stalin, remember Stalin? 
he actually died, shocking everybody back in 1953. Especially his guards were afraid to touch him for 16 hours. <laughs> he might be fooling us, this horrible man. And there was a power struggle within the Soviet Union. It took a couple years, and no one person would ever have the power Stalin did. But the leader amongst equals, so to speak, would become Nikita Khrushchev, a Ukrainian. In fact, that's why uh, Ukraine, which was a state within the Soviet Union, got Crimea. They're still writing about it to this day in Russia. It's uh, all kinds of historical stuff. But there's, you know, he's very bombastic. He brought a shoe to the United Nations, pulled out of his pocket to beat him a podium for endlessness. I guess that's a very Russian thing to do. No, we did not take off the shoe. He brought an extra shoe. But he wanted to end the Cold War, too. He was like Eisenhower. The Soviet economy was in shambles and the arms race was killing him. He wanted to end, the, end this arms race. Eisenhower did too. But he also wanted to show that the Soviet Union was still very strong. There was a race to get the first satellite into space, artificial satellite. And even though the Soviets, and we know this now for a fact, were way behind in rocket technology, they got the first one up. 1957, Sputnik, fellow travel. Wasn't very big. I mean, that's a mock up of it. Had just a little radio on it that, on a battery that beeped. Low orbit, so it's like when it crossed over around the United States, you could pick it up on short range radio. Just beep, beep, beep. Pretty good, huh? Feel like you're there. And it was so low of an orbit, you could see it go across the sky. And it eventually, the orbit degenerated and it burned up. But even though the United States knew, and I'll tell you why in a second, knew this, yeah, they got it up, they got this up here, or got that satellite up, it's way right behind. People in the US just freaked out. And they could see it, they could hear it. And it really implied that now the Soviet and their missile, the rocket technology is ahead. Another victory for the Soviet Union. Khrushchev looked like that's his crown as the Kremlin. But look like he's leading the Soviets to a new era. He even denounced Stalin. And the other thing is this. If you could put a satellite on a rocket and launch it into orbit, that means you have a rocket that's strong enough to put a nuclear warhead on it. Fly over the Arctic and into the United States. And now Americans felt really vulnerable. At first, Eisenhower tried to dismiss it, and then he realized, oh no, we have to do something. And so he announced that the Navy team, both the Army and the Navy are competing to build a rocket. The Navy team is ready to launch. We'll match them. <laughs> Nobody was more surprised than the Navy team. That was not even close to have a rocket ready. The Army team was actually way ahead. Nobody really knows why he said the Navy team. And so they tested it in Florida, and it got up about two feet and blew up. Thus the newspaper headline, oh, what a flopnik. Get it? Get it? Is it a spotnik? Okay, so, but now the Americans look even further behind. And so it hid the fact that the United States was actually way ahead in missile technology. But the feeling is America is even more vulnerable than ever before. Khrushchev got a great victory out of this. Now, this is going to lead to the idea that the Soviets are winning the Cold War. Two things will come out of this. First off, Army and Navy team will combine into NASA. And secondly, there'll be an emphasis on science. And for the first time, the U.S. government will fund science education. And so here it is, U.S. science and education lags the Soviets race ahead. There was an element of this. They were afraid to do any science going back to the Scopes monkey trial. The sound implications down the road, obviously. But Ike wanted arms control, and this is leading to the U-2 incident. The U-2 incident. Ike wanted arms control. Khrushchev wanted it, and the plan was to meet at Paris. It was going to be this triumphant, for Eisenhower, the general leading to peace. And 
relations had gotten better. In fact, Khrushchev even came to the United States. He was supposed to come for a couple of days and speak at the United Nations, stay for two weeks and tour the U.S. There he is at a dairy farm in Wisconsin. He would end at Disneyland, the brand new Disneyland in, uh, in California. And him walking around the, the brand new rides. There's a few films of him with Mickey. It's kind of funny. But part of the reason Eisenhower was so confident is because the U.S. had been doing illegal spy flights. A hot secret plane dubbed U-2, which is you, you, you mean utility to hide what it is. It's like a big glider. Could fly at 70,000 feet. Had a range of almost 8,000 miles. So from bases in places like Iran, it could reach almost every part of the Soviet Union. And from 70,000 feet, its cameras were so sensitive that they could read license plates. And so the U.S. was spying. And the Soviets could pick it up on radar, but their air defense couldn't reach it. And they were furious. This is a blatant violation of international law. The U.S. would go absolutely bonkers if the Soviets did it to the United States. But we just said, the United States said, the Soviets, typical communist dishonesty. We would never do that. Well, Eisenhower wanted the, the mission to stop. The CIA. So it was CIA pilots. But the bases were kind of quasi Air Force, CIA, some of Marine base, you know, wherever there's an air base. But it was CIA. The CIA said, we need one more flight. One more flight before the pair of suns. That's what we call famous last words. The flight took off from Iran, Iran, or Iran, and flew over Kazakhstan where they tested their missiles and up towards Moscow, then back. Its pilot, Francis Gary Powers. There he is on, that's next to his U-2. That was taken a month before. Well, he had engine problems the whole way. The engine actually went out, and he went to a glide. And before he, he could get it restarted, a brand new Soviet surface air missile exploded their life. He somehow bailed out. They actually didn't think he would survive. They didn't have an ejector seat. Jets have to have an ejector seat. You just bail out, it would be not a door. Uh, afterburn. He landed, dislocated his shoulder, that shoulder a little bit lower there, and the Soviets now had the CIA powder in the prison. Now the United States said, oh, weather plane got lost, and we're sorry for the loss of the crew. And then they brought out the wreckage, and the film survived the pictures, and now the United States was busted and one of the big things is this totally and completely humiliated Christian. Totally humiliated. And the Paris Peace Conference shattered. It's no coincidence that four months later, the Soviets would test the, test the 50 megaton czar. And all of a sudden, there were more tests than ever before. Both sides escalated. And the countries, the world is coming as close as it's ever going to get to nuclear annihilation. Two years after this. So Eisenhower's goal to be a peacemaker fell apart. And that's going to lead directly to the election of 1960. While this is going on, a number of people wanted to run for president, but the Democrats chose a very young, well liked senator, but he had virtually no record, partially because he was so sick. In fact, he missed an entire year because he was bedridden. They would find out later that it was a combination of a bad back from a World War II injury and Addison's disease. A very ill man by the name of John Kennedy. But they hid it through a combination of friendly press and lots of drugs. Uppers, downers, and steroids. Just kind of give him kind of this artificial look of, of being fit and vigorous. He was really ill. He was a hero of World War II. He was the commander of a patrol boat called the PT boat. Lots of references to it during the campaign. It was rammed by a Japanese destroyer. That's how he hurt his back really bad. But he'd be the first president ever elected or ever born in the 20th century. And really going to push this idea of a new man for a, a new time. His running mate would be the very prominent 
Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ. No one knows why Johnson gave up the Senate majority because vice presidents don't do anything. Break ties in the Senate and wait for the president to die. That's what we call foreshadowing. But he gave up that. So we have Kennedy, a liberal from Massachusetts, and then a liberal Southerner from Texas to balance out the ticket. The Republicans would nominate Richard Nixon, the vice president. He was just slightly older than Kennedy. And he knew Kennedy from the Senate, and Kennedy had the reputation before he got really sick as being just kind of a lightweight, a playboy. Not really serious. Now, you might think that would hurt Kennedy. That helped Kennedy. He has no record. So he could make his own record up. And everyone thought Nixon would be more experienced and would wipe the floor with him. But there was a small economic depression. Nixon was not very popular, well-liked. He was respected, he was smart, but he was known as a hatchet man. Eisenhower hated him, just hated his guts. In fact, Eisenhower was asked, what did, what did Nixon do while as vice president? What initiative did he take care of? And Eisenhower answered, this is right before the election, I can't think of anything, get back to me. That's just mean. <laughs> well, and then Castro, who it appeared more and more might be a communist, had won the civil war in Cuba. We'll come back to this. So now they could blame the Republicans for allowing a potentially communist government 90 miles from the shore. Now, we'll come back to this. Castro fits under the Bay of Pigs near the bottom. Also, during this election, the Kennedy campaign accused the Republicans of allowing for a missile gap. Remember the bomber gap? Now, this is the, now the Democrats are saying, because of Sputnik, we all know the Soviets have more intercontinental, ballist, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And if you want to make them, you can still buy this plastic model kit and paint American and Soviet ICBMs. Wouldn't that be a great thing for your mantelpiece? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Actually, there was a missile gap. It was huge. The United States had almost a thousand missiles in Turkey, Japan, and Italy that could reach most parts of the Soviet Union. And we're putting in their first ICBMs called Titans in Wyoming. And in a year and a half, we'll have the Minutemen in River Great Falls. Guess how many of the Soviets have in election that could reach the United States? One! They literally just made their first one, but it took two days to refuel. So there's a huge missile gap. But they couldn't say anything because of national security. They couldn't disclose how many U-2 flights there actually were. One more thing. This would be the first ever presidential debates. Kennedy challenged Nixon, and Nixon just assumed, I'm going to wipe the floor with this white piece. But it didn't happen that way. Kennedy looked great on television, while Nixon looked sweaty. And what, what, uh, one newspaper said he looked like a sinister a sinister chipmunk. Now, after the AP exam, I'll take some time to tell you some stories. I'll tell you the whole story of the debate. It's a pretty funny story. But here's the big thing about it. image. Image on the TV screen, and now today, a screen, not only a screen, is going to become more important than reality more than ever before. We've already had the image going back to the William Henry Harris and the Log Cabin campaign back in 1840. We saw images of like FDR's great voice on the radio, but now just seeing it. So Kennedy, who was this ill man, who was in a, on literally a cocktail of actually some pretty dangerous narcotics and lots of steroids. Um, but he looked fit and vigorous while Nixon looked ill and sweaty. <laughs> he sweated all. So image. Jumping right to this. So in 1960, when the election returns finally came out in a very close election, Kennedy was elected. Both sides did cut maybe some voter shenanigans, shenanigans in Illinois. We don't know for sure. But Kennedy won a close election. Now remember, the popular vote doesn't matter. Actually, the, well, the popular vote only matters in each individual state to get all the electors in that state. The popular vote was really close. 
only 0.1% separated the two. Kennedy won the Electoral College, but some Southerners down here, electoral, some Southern electors, even though they were pledged for Kennedy, voted for a segregation, Terry Byrd, because Kennedy supported civil rights. That chinking or that chipping away of the armor of the solid South. And so with that, Eisenhower is going to give his farewell address. And that too is on your review. It's right after the U2 incident. And in it, actually, he's really depressed over the, the not having peace. He warned of what he called the industrial military complex, a group of military leaders, big arms manufacturers, and politicians who got money from the arms manufacturers and thought to get political gain from war, who tried to manipulate. This power, the, uh, the, the disastrous rise of misplaced power, to exaggerate the threat and get the United States into moral war. He saw this cabal as a real threat and warned against its growth. And this is kind of one of those famous last words, because of course he's going to be ignored. John Kennedy, one of his most important planks, was a massive increase in defense spending. And the largest peacetime increase in defense spending in American history up to that time would be John Kennedy. So Kennedy, so he could be tough on communism and finish the New Deal. So he is going to be ignored. Eisenhower warned this will lead to more wars and soon constant war. And boy, did he turn out to be clairvoyant. And yes, he helped cause a lot of it too. So the new frontier was Kennedy's program to finish up the New Deal and the Federal Deal. And it had a lot of different programs, but one of the biggest planks was civil rights. Civil rights. Also a big increase in defense spending. He called it flexible response, emphasizing conventional weapons. And he really liked the irregular forces to fight guerrillas like Rangers and this new group called Special Forces. But everyone called the Special Forces after the very distinctive French hat they wore, the Green Berets. Kennedy loved them. They would be sent to Vietnam to train the South Vietnamese Army. Now, none of this passed except defense spending. Kennedy did not really have an understanding of the Senate. Once LBJ was out of the Senate, like, oh, Thank goodness he's gone. He was such a kind of a grand to set it. They have any power. When LBJ would become president, nobody would pass more laws than Lyndon Johnson ever in history. But now he's just vice president. So in 59, now this goes under the Bay of Pigs, there was a Cuban revolution. Now I mentioned it once before. The horrible dictator, Fiorella Batista, and there's Baptista right there. He was overthrown, actually shockingly fast, by revolution under, revolutionaries under Fidel Castro. And even though it's unclear if Castro was going to be a full-fledged communist, it was basically decided he was a communist by 1960. He wanted land reform, the same thing that our bench wanted in Guatemala. Baptista was so corrupt that the U.S. quit supporting him in 1958 because he was so tied to organized crime. And a lot of those, he kicked off organized crime, and that's when they all went full in in the United States. So they go to casinos. All went to Vegas. All the big casinos in Vegas up to the um, late early 1990s were all organized crime. Now they're all big corporations. Well, Castro is a communist. Eisenhower immediately set up plans to house them, just like Guatemala. Make a fake army in Guatemala, mostly a bunch of thugs and hooligans from Batista, and that began the plan, known as the Bay of Pigs. But it wasn't ready when Eisenhower was president, so it'd be ready in April 1961. Kennedy is going to get this plan to trigger this popular uprising. The thought was they would land, and it was a terrible place to land called the Bay of Pigs in southern Cuba. They would land the, the United States would try to act like we have nothing to do with this. This is all Cuban revolutionaries. They're going to trade in Guatemala. But it was Ike's plan. So Kennedy didn't like it. If it failed, 
Kennedy would get all the blame. If it worked, he wouldn't get all the credit. Kennedy wanted his own plan. And so they landed. Here's Castro at the front in an armored personnel carrier leading the troops. Not only did it fail, but the people of Cuba overwhelmingly supported Castro. There was no uprising. Castro was incredibly popular. He got rid of the, as they saw, a puppet of the Americans. And that's the Cuban cigar exploding in Kennedy's mouth. Get it? That's another funny. Yes, Kennedy liked to smoke cigars. JFK would be blamed and humiliated. He blamed the CIA. And so there's going to be a lot of distrust, especially when the CIA begged Kennedy to send in American troops. And he said, I'm not going to have World War III over a failure. And Cuba and the Soviet Union are going to be pushed closer together. The Soviet Union feels really vulnerable because of the American superiority in missiles and bombers. And now Cuba's thinking, they want me out. Castro's thinking. At the same time, Berlin, a divided city within East Germany, it's the centerpiece of the Cold War. And what was going on there was called the brain drain. It, there was free traffic between East and West. You could go into East Berlin. Anybody from behind the Iron Curtain would go to East Berlin. This seemed like a showpiece city for socialism. They rebuilt it like, and, uh, to make it look a socialist paradise. It's kind of funny going there now. And they could cross over to the Western occupation zones and just stay. And soon, by 1959, hundreds, by 61,000 of mostly young people Dissolution by the police state that's actually being created in the East after the promise of a socialist paradise. They're leaving. And Khrushchev is worried. How can he say the Soviet system is doing well if people are running away? It's a real crisis. This is a, from a pamphlet they would give American forces in the occupation zone. There was even a summit in Vienna with Castro and Kennedy. And Khrushchev kind of browbeat Kennedy and said, you got to do something about Berlin. Kennedy said, I will fight, because Kennedy was embarrassed about the Bay of Pigs. It really looked like they're closer to war. And then literally in the middle of the night, August 1961, each German soldier, but obviously with the support of the Soviet Union, put a barbed wire in the middle of the night and started building a temporary, eventually building a much stronger wall. Like overnight, boom, a wall dividing the sections and making it very difficult for Germans to cross back and forth. And so there were families that were split. In fact, a lot of people in the West lived in the East because the rent was lower and woke up and they couldn't get back. Or they went to visit family on one side and couldn't get back. So families were divided. This was just a total surprise. And here's bar, the quick barbed wire put up in front of the Brandenburg Gate. The Reichstag is right here, just right in front. And that's the uh, Uter den Linn in the main street in Berlin. This border guard had these very distinctive sunglasses. So one AP photographer took about 30 pictures of him. And his face uh, is going to be on everything for the, about the Berlin Wall for years to come. He just looks so sinister in that with a Soviet submachine gun. Well. Is this an idea of Soviet aggression on the way to swallow up Berlin, or is this absolute desperation? If you have to build a wall to keep your people in, and like that German, that East German soldier right there who is making a break for it, your country has real trouble. Real troubles. I should add, all along this was barbed wire and landmines. All along this point. But Berlin was inside. And here's looking over the family's divide. Eventually they would make steel or cement and steel rebar wall. And it would go all the way across Berlin and then barbed wire all the way around. So Switzerland married a Berliner, he grew up right here. I mean, as a little kid, you know, the wall, what he's in the wall is about a quarter mile from the and when he, when he was in high school, they would drive to the wall and they would get on the car and look over the wall and yell insult at the East German border guards to the front of the machine. He's a little crazy. 
but still is. And this became this isolated little island within the East. And a lot of people thought this is a measure of Soviet aggression. This is where John Kennedy would give maybe his most famous speech, where he would go there and say, Berlin, we're going to consider part of the United States. We will defend it. If it's attacked, we will defend it like it's part of the U.S. Do I have the speech here? But he will depend, and you can see his phonetic labeling right, or his phonetic spelling on his note card there, so he gets it right. They all went nuts, which means I'm a citizen of Berlin. Ich bin ein Berliner. He added, so it could be in German, phonetically spelled. Well, everybody knew what he meant. It's, it's, it's a very colloquial way of saying I'm from Berlin. But then somebody noticed a Berliner is also a jelly donut. And so then, yes, he was saying he's a jelly donut. Now, he wasn't, but you still hear people say that to this day. So this actually comes from 2005. I was in Berlin. I was on food for in London. I walked into a little store, and there was a sticker of a jelly donut saying, Ich bin ein Berliner. It was 150 euro. But I had to buy it. So I went and bought that. So if you still hear people say that to this day, no, everybody knew what he was saying. It's a happy donut. Do you like Berliners? A good Berliner is good. That's not being obvious. A bad one is bad. But in reality, it led to a neat, uh, it actually cooled tension and a sale. There's some tourists in front of the gate, of the wall. On the western side would be filled with graffiti. There's still a little bit of the wall left. Now it's part of the museum, but almost it's almost all gone. Now there's bricks that lay down where it is. I like this picture where they can see a building, the stronger wall, the Brandenburg gates right here, and this is the the um, hawking ruins of the um, a Reichstag, which would be rebuilt to the 1990s to back into the German capital. The West German capital, they put in this little tiny town called Bonn. The whole idea is we're going to get Berlin someday. We'll come back. So we, we don't want to put it in a big city like Hamburg. Well, while this is going on, we're leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis. What happened was this. The United States began a top secret. Americans would not find out fully until 1976. Plan to assassinate Castro called monkeys. And they had all kinds of plans. Exploding cigars, exploding seashells. A former lover assassinated him. He smoked cigars. They thought they could sneak a, a, an exploding cigar in his stash. They actually got it in, but it was like twice as big as a normal cigar. She figured it out. But, oh, they also got it's a bunch of mobsters at this upstate New York resort, the CIA enlisted um, organized crime to try to kill Castro. Now, these are all, they all failed miserably, but Castro knew they're trying to kill him. They, he knew. They've already invaded. They're trying to kill me. They're going to come back again. And that is going to lead to this idea. Castro and Khrushchev felt weak. They both felt weak. And that's why they decided, let's put Soviet missiles in Cuba to deter the United States. I like that picture of them, those two hugging. That's one of the more famous pictures. Khrushchev seems unusually happy. He was a very jovial man, but I love that bad magazine from 1963. They didn't know about the exploding cigar gimmick, yet they put him up with a, I just think that's pretty funny, on Castro. So they put these missiles, and that is going to lead to October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is the closest that people knew we came to nuclear war. In 79, we came within about a minute from blowing the world up. But fortunately, most people didn't know. I was so glad that I was asleep in Mile City. I didn't know. I will tell you that story after the exam. 
I, I, it's a good story. It's kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call shocking. I guess I probably would not have cared. Because I would have just been waiting for fallout. Anyways, I like this one. They're both sitting on H bombs and they're arm wrestling. But you'll notice their fingers on the button to explode it. But do you see the problem here? Let's say Kennedy wins. What's going to happen? And it's going to hit the button, meaning no one can win this. It's a very clever cartoon. U2 flights illegally over Cuba on October 14th took these pictures that were clearly the Soviets putting in medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. That means if these are operational, they could reach Washington, D.C. in about 12 minutes. That's not enough time to do anything. And so, now the U.S. had missiles in Turkey and Italy that could do almost the same thing. And these are the various places where they had reconnaissance. And for the next week, the Kennedy administration sweated over this because the feeling was their longer range missiles could reach almost every place in the United States. Now, regardless of the fact that the U.S. was doing it to the Soviets, Kennedy knew politically he couldn't have this. Can you imagine the beating the Democrats would take by the, from the Republicans if they allowed missiles in Cuba? So the first thought was, got out of order here. The first thought was an invasion, but they realized that could lead to World War III. I must have accidentally erased that. That would lead to World War III. And what if the Soviets just swallow up Berlin? We can't invade. So they decided to do a blockade. Now, they called it the quarantine because a blockade is an act of war. So they just changed the name. They allow no Soviet ships into Cuba. So originally, it was going to be uh, 200 miles. They moved it back to 100 miles. That's an American patrol plane, a P-2, flying over a Soviet transport. And on the deck, we believe are rockets, more rockets. Oh, the film didn't come in. But Kennedy announced it to the world on a surprise television appearance on all three television networks on October 22nd. Well, he announced this, but also announced the United States, if the Soviets don't pull back, we'll use force. And so all over the world, they said, hey, you got to um, practice civil defense, you know where your bomb shelters are, all over the West. World War III could happen at any moment. This would be for the next six days, literally on the razor's edge. Now, there's going to be a number of instances over the next few days where World War III almost happened. I'm shocked it didn't. But on the 24th, the first Soviet ships got to that 100-mile line, and they stopped. The stalemate on that line. I will tell you this story after the war, but they really blew the world up right there. Then two days later, three more times. But I'd work, I'm sorry, four more times. But I World War Three. Those are good days. Well, finally, both sides agree on the 28th to pull back. The U.S. agreed to not invade Cuba. The Soviets agreed to pull the missiles out. But in secret, we also said we pulled the missiles out of Turkey and Italy. Now, we were going to pull them out anyways because they were obsolete, liquid fuel, dangerous things. And we were just putting in those Minuteman missiles and great things. The missiles have solid fuel, solid hydrogen oxygen fuel, and it needs dry climate or it begins to degrade. Can you think of any place drier than Canada, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota? That's why they're all here. And they're still there. We have now they're 100, we have minimum three years currently. Yes. Montana, North Dakota, Washington. And where are the Soviet missiles? In dry areas. Well, now Russian missiles. 
I have a bad out. I'll still occasionally call Russia today the Soviet Union because I grew up with it. If I do that, I'm sorry. I'll still call the Czech Republic Czechoslovakia. And then came back for the brink. This is about as close as they as it got. Well, no, 83 was about three hours. I should tell you about, I'll tell you about 83 too. Operation Able Archer. <laughs> Thank you. I knew a little bit about that one, but didn't know how bad it was. 79, I had no idea until years later. Whew, it was close. Oh, I don't see any time. Hmm? Yeah, which stats? Ready for it? You know, you're going to do fine and why not? Yeah. Your best, whatever. Yeah, if anybody did not grab one of these, you're gone. Grab one. And our packet is in the Yeah, very good. I know it's off. Here's the big thing. Yeah. But I'm going to put the whole thing on. Uh, at lunch today or tomorrow? Today. Uh, both? Yeah, sounds good. Tomorrow. Have you got them done? No? No, working on the review packet. Forever. Forever. But. Coming away. If you were gone yesterday, or did, I'm sorry, if you did not come to the pra the review session, grab this. If you didn't come to the review session, grab that thing by the by the uh Do we actually have to like take this out and turn it in? No, no, not to that. Yeah, that's just for you to look at. Okay. So I want you to go through and just on your own go to the errors. Okay. I have I have work. And huh? I have work. I have work. And I have work on Wednesday, but I'm gonna take Where do you work at? That's great. Nice job. Anyway, I think can I have one of those documents? I think you have that skill set. You're very talented. You work at the big deal firm. Please. So I'll put this last one in there, record them.
things we can do to pass it. It makes sense. Even if it's Oh, really? Oh, that's section please grab this and this little study guide I gave it's not something you have to turn in uh, just so I'm, I'm clear about this but these are all the different youth periods but these are the major topics and the big thing about this one is if you can go through and if you can brainstorm about 10 things or so from that era and you are from each of those you're in great shape and yes there's going to be duplication in periods but 10 different things around that era. If you go through and you don't know, then you know any of them, that's where you know you have to go back and study. And so, for example, like if you get the Great Depression, causes and the New Deal, then you can think about things like you know, the stock market crash, debt, deflation, um, Glass-Steagall Act, WPA. I'm just throwing things out there. The Dust Bowl. You get 10 of those, you're in good shape. That's just an example. Especially before 1980, because there won't be really any essay talks about that to worry about. And so, just a great study guide. This is something a, a student, some students of mine in the past came up with this idea, and I thought, God, what a great idea. And because they were doing it, so we made it, and then I kind of changed it around for the new test. But if you go about 10 things, you're in good shape. And yes, we'll be duplication. Without helping you for knowledge about the choice, but obviously for finding the short answer questions or the essays. All right, let's go take your notes out. And also, if you have a review packet, take that one out. Because if you can also fill out the review packet, I'm going to basically, except for the last little bit on Vietnam, everything I'm just going to kind of go through things with a review packet. I'm going to go through pretty fast, but go through a lot. Did we get to the Geneva Convention? That's right. We're Let me do this really quick, and then we'll get back to the pack. I had to do a trick uh, I just left. Did you? You weren't here yesterday, were you? Right. Oh, we're Oh, one more thing. So today, tomorrow at lunch, if anybody wants to come in, I will answer any question for that last page in the review. Because you have to do period nine. I will go, I will answer anything on that. So you will come and ask questions on that last page. I will do that at lunch today and tomorrow. So if you want to come in, I will eat my lunch, but I'll answer questions as we do. Okay, so let's get to, we got right to Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam the French. Let me just do this really quick to finish up yesterday, then back, then I'll get to the review packet. Do, do we have any of it all divided into four countries? So the French left after Dien Bien Phu. They divided it up into four countries, but North and South Vietnam would have elections to unify in a year or two years. But the United States was completely opposed to this. 
And the United States convinced the South, Ho Chi Minh was in the North, convinced the South, and the South nixed the elections. No election. They claimed the communists will cheat and lie. Here's John Foster Dulles talking about it. And so the United States is going to ally themselves with the South. And so they violated the Geneva Accords. And this is going to lead to the Civil War. And that's what the United States is going to get involved in. So the South is, so the United States is allied with the South. And thus the goal of what's going to be the Vietnam War a permanent South Vietnam or two Vietnams. So the Vietnam War was about the United States keeping a basically pro-Southern dictator under the the no the win Sam. That's as close as I can get to pronouncing it. The dictator of South Vietnam. And the United States said he was an ally. Cito was another one of those military alliances, but he was an ally under attack from the North and the communists. Now that's not 100% true, but that would be the justification to start sending troops to train South Vietnamese forces and eventually full scale war. But that is the goal to Vietnam. That was the Vietnam War. John Foster Dulles, the win. Very corrupt dictator. South Vietnam was corrupt too. So, Civil War would start by 1957. Eventually, the National Liberation Front would be created, the NLF. And that is their flag right there on the right. And those are NLF guerrillas. They want one Vietnam. Now, Zim, knowing he needs American support, is going to brand them communists by calling them the Viet Cong. And even though most of the actual soldiers were not communists or anything else, they just were fighting against the southern government, the Viet Cong was directed from the north. Despite their propaganda saying it was purely southern, now the leadership was in the north, the north was sending weapons and aid to the Viet Cong. When the United States started sending troops to South Vietnam to fight, the north started sending troops to South Vietnam. And that's how it escalated. That would happen until 1965. So that is the Vietnam War. So a couple of things are going to happen then while this is going on. And these are all irregular guerrilla forces. So South Vietnam, that's where the fighting would be. But the U.S. will start bombing the North to convince them to stop helping the Viet Cong. That's coming a little bit later. So, 56, there was, with the encouragement of the United States, they, the people of Hungary, removed this uh, harsh, Stalinist dictator. Now, that is in your review packet. I believe it's about halfway down on page 10. That sound about right? Yeah, Hungary. Hungary. Remove a Stalinist dictator. But, the Soviet response was fierce. The Soviets invaded and brutally put that down. And there will be cries from Hungary waiting for America to come to their aid. America promised and yet did not come to their aid. So those are Soviet uh, T-54 tanks going through Budapest. Now part of the reason is the United States might have wanted, thought it would look tough for domestic politics. We're helping. We'll encourage Hungary to revolt. But are we really, are we, we as a country, really willing to blow the world up? You have atomic war over Hungary. Would you be willing to die for Hungary? Yeah, we want Hungary to be free. I like Hungary. Hungary now is a fascist president, but that's another story today. But, we were not willing to do it. And that shows the problems with the Cold War. You can talk tough. Are you really willing to do it? But ironically, this was at a time where the Soviet Union was actually um, becoming more tolerant. Stalin, remember Stalin? He 
shocking everybody. And I love these. So this one is a German propaganda poster for Stalin. He died in 1953, three years before this. They kind of kept it secret for a while. Um, it shocked everybody. I'll tell you the whole story about this. After the exam, I'll tell you a few stories because it's kind of amazing. But there's going to be a power struggle afterwards. And eventually, somebody who was considered to be not quite the hardliner and the surprise would come out on top. Not the full leader. There's going to be a group called the Politburo that will run it. And there'll never be a, a total dictator of the Soviet Union again. But his name, Nikita Khrushchev. And Khrushchev, and this is what we're leading to, Sputnik. Khrushchev became the new leader, and he wanted the Soviet system to survive. And so he had to end the arms race. He was very bombastic. When he spoke to the United Nations, he brought a shoe. It's a very Russian thing, I think. And he pulled the shoe out to beat the podium during the talk. So that is him beating his shoe on the podium of the United Nations. Gotta be clear. I was always told when I was in school, he took off his shoe. No, he brought a third shoe. He was thinking ahead. And he had a great success because shocking everybody, in 1957, the Soviets launched the first artificial satellite called Sputnik. And the Soviets took a big risk because their rockets were not very, or not very advanced. They were behind the Americans. But they rolled the die, and this is the, the satellite being launched. This is a mock-up of it. It's really small. Had a low orbit, had a low uh, transistor or a radio transmitter that could be picked up on short wave, wave radio, and it just beeped until the battery run out. And it was in such a low orbit, it eventually degraded and burnt up in the atmosphere. But they could see it, night sky flying over America. And with a radio, you could pick up the beep. And so it appeared like another victory. There's him like, like the king, the Kremlin is his crown. This terrified Americans, terrified them. Another victory for the Soviets. But not just that. If you can put a rocket into space and launch a satellite, that means you have a rocket that's strong enough to put a nuclear weapon on it, fly over the Arctic and hit every place in the United States. And they could see the Sputnik up there. Like the Sputnik will attack him. This terrified people. At first, Eisenhower, the Eisenhower administration was like, it's not a big deal. They actually had secret information to know the U.S. was way ahead. But then they realized, well, we got to do something. So the IDR, Eisenhower administration, to counter the satellites, said the Navy team, the Army and the Navy team were competing for rockets. The Navy team will soon launch the first American satellite. Nobody was more surprised than the Navy team. Their last three rockets have exploded on the launch pad. They weren't even close. The Army was way ahead, but for some reason, I said the Navy. So they very dutifully put out this rocket. And here's a picture of the launch. It got five feet up and blew up. And so now we look like bigger fools. Yes, eventually we will get a rocket up. But you can imagine how the, the newspaper headlines are going to be. I love this one. Oh, what a flop, Nick. Get it? Botnik. Okay, so with that, so look at the Soviets are winning. This was huge. They got rockets, they got missiles, they're winning again. The Army and Navy team after this will be combined into NASA. And for the first time, the U.S. will start funding public education in science and math. And these both these cartoons have U.S. education like and U.S. complacency. So the United States will get going on that a little bit. First time since the Scopes monkey trial. So that's Sputnik. Also, ironically, this would help open the door to potential arms control that Ike wanted. Khrushchev wanted this too. And they were gonna meet in 1960 in Paris and maybe come up with an arms control talk. Part of the reason Eisenhower was so confident is because the U.S. had been running secret and illegal spy missions. U-2 spy planes and U, top secret planes, you just made utility to hide what it was. It's like a really big glider that could get 70,000 feet, but flying from bases like Iran, Iran, 
They could blanket all the Soviet Union. And the cameras were so precise that at 70,000 feet, they could read a license plate. And so they, they, we knew that we're actually headed to the Soviets, despite their launch. Now, I should have. The Soviets were nuts. Khrushchev was furious about this. said, there'll be no Paris peace talk if you keep flying this. They could see it on radar, but they, their air defenses couldn't get it. And the U.S. would have gone bonkers if the Soviets ever did it to the United States, which they didn't. But the U.S. did it hundreds of times, very illegally. Khrushchev even came to the United States. He was going to go for a couple of days and speak at the United Nations, ended up staying for two weeks, touring the United States. Here he is at a Wisconsin cat, um, dairy farm. He would end up at the brand new Disneyland in Anaheim, California. So there's film of him with Mickey and Donald Duck. It's pretty funny. But the CIA, which was running these illegal missions, said one more flight. And so in 1960, Francis Gary Powers was going to fly one more flight. There he is two months before he was shot down. What happened was having trouble with the plane, it actually lost power and glided down to its Soviet missiles, the brand new Soviet surface air missiles. It was knocked out of, out of the sky. This ended any chance for a peace agreement and actually escalated it, the chance for war. At first, Eisenhower said, we regret to inform a weather plane got lost and the pilot was lost. But they didn't expect the pilot to survive the crash. He not only survived, you see the shoulder, he had severely dislocated the shoulder, bailing out. The wreckage and the film survived. Khrushchev was furious and humiliated. That's why three months later, they would explode the Tsar bomb, that 50 megaton bomb. And both sides started exploding bombs like mad. And over the next two years would be almost, a, would probably be the most publicly known um, nuclear, or coming up to the most publicly known nuclear confrontation. Nobody outside the Soviet Union knew how close it would be in 83. They were within hours of launching. And in 1979, the United States was within minutes of blowing the world up. I didn't know about it at the time. I was really glad when that happened. I was asleep in beautiful Mile City. But with that, we have an election. And the election of 1960, there would be another one of these Cold War elections. Now, a Cold warrior, but also very economically liberal, a descendant of a New Deal, John Kennedy, unknown, very young senator from Massachusetts. Even though he had been senator for, he'd been elected for a couple terms, he had no record. He was incredibly ill. A very sick man. Later on, it was um, a number of problems with injuries from the World War II. He was a war hero from World War II, and also Addison's disease. He was actually spent an entire year of a Senate term in a hospital bed. He was given the last rites twice. They thought he was going to die in the 1950s. Yet he had this miraculous recovery and would run for president in 1960. Now, this was all kept secret. He was on a cocktail of amphetamines, barbiturates, and steroids just to get him through the day. They kept secret how desperately ill he was. Yet he looked fit, young, and vigorous. Now, he's a Massachusetts liberal. So they chose... And surprisingly, he took the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson of Texas, would be the vice president. And the vice presidents don't do anything except break ties in the Senate. Oh, they have one more job, too, to wait for the president to die. This is what we call foreshadowing. Lyndon Johnson, for reasons nobody knew, he took the presidency because vice presidents don't do anything. And he was the most powerful Senate Majority Leader ever. But... They're going to run, oh, you'd be the first president born in the 20th century. They really played this idea that he was a war hero. He was a captain of a patrol boat called PT boat, PT-109. And he was young, very young, fit, vigorous, exciting, new. The Republicans nominated another young man, but he was vice president with a long record, Richard Nixon, who is known as somewhat of a hatchet man. 
but very competent, a good debater, very intelligent, incredibly ambitious, also incredibly socially awkward, Richard Nixon. But there was a small recession the Republicans were blamed for. Also, and we'll come back to this, Fidel Castro had won a revolution against the dictatorship the U.S. supported in Cuba. And so now that they, they could say, the Republicans have allowed a communist 90 miles from our shore. Here's Castro in New York. He, he appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show with the UN and forced a bunch of kids to grow beards. No, he was, he was like a, he was really uh, popular, like a, a big celebrity when he came to Australia. I think, I think that picture's funny. But remember the bomber gap? This time they did the missile gap. Saying that the Soviets had more missiles than the United States. And how do we know this? Sputnik. Now, it wasn't true. The U.S. had hundreds of missiles that could reach all population centers of the Soviet Union in Turkey and Italy, also in Japan. We had bombers there, too. And we had the first intercontinental ballistic missile, missiles we just put in Wyoming. And in a year, they'll be putting the modern new Minuteman missiles around Great Falls. Minuteman, they had solid fuel engines, but solid fuel degrades in humid climates. So can you think of a better, can you think of any better place than Montana to put those missiles? Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. That's where the missiles are. Human, because it's not human. And they're still there. If you take that lovely drive to Great Falls, and if, and I know all of you love going to Great Falls, it's such a beautiful fun place to go to. But you know that place, Alm? There's a hill and you go to Alm. If you're going towards Great Falls, start going down the hill, look to the right, there's a square fence. That's a Minuteman 3 ICBM. And if you want to have fun, go shake the fence. <laughs> Don't do that. Unless you like jazz. But moving on. Oh, and I know you also want to make a plastic bottle set of all the American and Soviet ICBMs, right? Would that be fun? Would that look great on your mantelpiece? This is the Satan missile. The Soviets just launched an improved Satan missile, not the Soviets, I'm sorry, the Russians, a week ago. Oh. There was a missile gap. So the U.S. had all those missiles. Guess how many missiles the Soviets had that could reach the United States on election day? They literally just made their first one. The U.S. had over a thousand. Now, some were old, like this old Atlas missile, and they were already like they wanted to get rid of it. But still, the U.S. had this big advantage. Also, the first election where there was debates. Kennedy challenged Nixon to a presidential debate, they would be televised. And they're not debates like debates today, are these. They're off debates today. They just spew off talking points. Back then, um, a little more organized, they had a little bit longer to talk and develop positions. I, Kennedy just, um, or Nixon thought he just wiped the floor with Kennedy. Nixon was experienced, he was a debater. Kennedy had a reputation of being a lightweight, kind of a playboy, which he kind of was. And so Nixon thought he walked the floor with them. But when they got to the television screen, Nixon looked like, well, a TV camera said he looked like a sinister chipmunk. He looked sweaty, mean, beady-eyed. He just didn't come across well on TV. And that's why image has become more important than ever. Image at first on the TV screen, but then image on any screen. So this whole image thing, this goes back to William Henry Harrison and the law cabinet camp. And we can see it like an FDR on the radio, but now it's all the image. And so Nixon looked old, weak, evil. Kennedy looked very just active and vigorous. And Kennedy was the one that was deathly ill. Oh, I, I forgot to add, he was also on a cocktail of painkillers because of his bad back. It's kind of amazing Kennedy could function. And so when the election happened, it was a razor thin Kennedy victory. Razor thin. Montana was really close, but went for Nixon. Nevada, 
went for Kennedy. Interesting state. But you'll notice one more thing if you look at this. A few electors from the South, Mississippi and Alabama, they were pledged to vote for Kennedy because they went to the solid South, solid South was still Democratic. But they voted for Harry Byrd as a protest vote because Kennedy was supporting civil rights. And so this is already a chink in the armor of the Democratic Party. You can see a few states going. Republicans are going to take advantage of this and become anti-civil rights, but that's coming in the next election. And so Eisenhower is going to warn in his farewell address about what he called the military industrial complex. Now I get stopped recording. 